situation where I have multiple disks ending on L. Um, what kind of operations does that allow me to do? Okay. So to address this question, let me kind of uh, some notation. So let me sort of un 
going to start with L. I'm going to forget that it came to me as an active Ronian. I'm just going to think, suppose like a topological surface. Um, so just suppose we were given um, surface L and a collection, if I'll write a script C. for how we're going to talk about this kind of data. Um, so it's been officially decided that it's okay to use these forward trays. <coughs> so let's say, for example, here's a picture of What is that? It's just a choice of one of the co-normal directions to the curve. And the way that I'm going to draw that throughout the talk is I'll just put some hairs indicating the co-orientation that I've chosen. So this is the kind of general local model for the kind of thing we were talking about earlier. Um, if I have an exact Lagrangian with a bunch of disks, I can describe that by saying, take a Weinstein neighborhood of L. So here, just take T star of L. Co-orientation that tells me how to lift them up to logical Lagrangians. I have some handles, and now I have um, a Weinstein manifold. with a natural Lagrangian skeleton. So sitting inside this, I have um, L together with all the disks. And I'm going to write that as S sub C. Okay. So here's our setup. And the question was, so what kind of operations can I do on this thing? So does it make any kind of sense to talk about it? So in this picture, I had a single disk. What if I had another disk attached to L? Does it make sense to talk about doing a surgery on one and then the other disk? Okay. So if I'm going to do that, I need to explain some kind of way of taking this 
some other disc maybe attached to L on the side here, and carrying it through this surgery to get some disc now attached to this new exacto project. And then I would be able to do this surgery on that, et cetera, et cetera, and I'd be able to iterate this um, surgery process. So the answer to that question, um, I claim is the following, in terms of this sort of combinatorial geometric data, it's described as follows. So I'm going to find or if I want to emphasize the choice of the disk I'm mutating at um, as u sub k. So it's a new uh, configuration of curves. As I already used in the terminology without uh, explaining it, but I call this the mutation of the original curve collection at, at ck. And I'll just define it for you by explaining what happens in this picture here. So let me draw the mutation. same curve as C3, but I'm going to reverse its co-orientation. So I still have this blue strand here, um, but now the hairs are going to point this other way. So are, is that at all a visible distinction to the people on the right side of the room? <laughs> Just saying what curve you're mutating on, I can't see the substance. I'm mutating at the blue, yeah, sorry, <laughs> mutating the blue curve, hence I wrote mutation in blue. <laughs> okay, so now what happens to the other curves? Well, if ci prime, or i not equal 3, this is going to be uh, the result of taking ci, I twist it around C3, where, whenever uh, it intersects with positive weight. So the convention of what's positive and what's negative will be defined when I finish filling in this picture. So I'll say that this intersection between the green and the blue curves is negative. So I'm going to leave that alone. So C2 prime is the same as C2. And this intersection then has got to be positive. So I take this red curve, I leave it alone outside a, a collar around the blue curve, and then I twist it like this. <laughs> Here's my new curve, uh, new curve configuration. Let's take the mutation of the original one. Uh, so I can take this, and now, following this prescription, I attach a bunch of handles. I get another Weinstein manifold. Uh, and the basic theorem. So this is the right answer in the sense that there exists a, a support morphism. target of this map, so it's a subset of this new skeleton, and look at the pre-image in here, and I compare it to the kind of L sitting inside WC, the way I define WC, as a subset of this first skeleton 
sub C. This differs by uh, disk surgery. So now I sort of, I know how to answer this question, right? So I can keep performing this process iteratively now, um, and I'll get a bunch of different exact Lagrangians. So let me try to explain, okay, so I asserted some funny rule. Where does the funny rule come from? Um, it comes from the following. Uh, so I'm going to, let me take... So let me draw a picture of D3, the disk that's attached to that blue curve, and draw a picture of a neighborhood of that disk and the skeleton S of C. So this is a neighborhood of D3 and S of C. So the first thing I'm going to have is I have a little collar around the blue curve in L and this torus. First, it is P3. Um, and now I'm also going to have little pieces of the other two disks. Right? Every, at both of those intersections, I have kind of fins attached to this picture. Um, or these other disks, D1, pieces of these disks, D1 and D2. I'm going to study the surgery by taking this neighborhood and I'm going to deform the skeleton by kind of bending it. So the way I'm going to bend it is um, the result will be some picture like this. We're going to flatten out the bottom part of this. So now, here's the blue curve, here's the green curve still, here's the red curve, okay. so I kind of reached my hand down through this tube, took this disc, and I like <coughs> pressed it down against the blackboard to kind of flatten out the bottom part of this collar to be flush with that disc. Okay, so now that, that this part of the original surface L and the disc I'm doing the surgery at will live in the same plane. And I'm going to think of this as being inside um, I plan out my pictures a little carefully now. Let's do it like this. So I can think of this now as being in T star R2. So at a T star of the R2 that the bottom of this picture lives. And I'm going to look at that picture from above, just like before. So um, here I was kind of drawing. So this is a ton of Lagrangian in T star of R2. So I'll draw it using that same sort of convention up there about co-oriented uh, curves. Now, <coughs> I look at this picture from above. I have something like this. Okay, so <coughs> from above. Now the point is that I can model this. Uh, this disc surgery, together with what happens to the other discs, as just a cone over a cardinal <coughs> isotopy at the boundary of T star R2. So I'll, I'll draw a movie of this isotopy. So 
um, the result is going to be, I take this kind of blue uh, conical part here, the top part of this tube, and I'm going to contract that through the origin and let it come through on the other side. So after the whole process, um, I'm going to have a new I'm going to have another circle, but the orientation is going to be reversed. So while I'm going through this process, I, I shrink it down. It comes a very small circle at first. And it passes through the co-circle above the origin. Um, and now I just look at what happened to the other, the red and the green curve as I go through this movie. And what happens is that they do this. And now you can see why this intersection got created up there. Okay. So now I take this new picture, I undo the whole procedure, um, and I uh, arrive at um, that picture on the way up there. So there is sort of where the rule comes from and why that statement should be true. So we can go there for the first picture the one in the two vision capacitors or or not? Sorry, they should be uh, the one is the one that goes in red. Ah, yes, thank you. That's a great, um, that was a test to make sure someone was listening. <laughs> and it passes. Um, okay, great. Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah. So, um, it seems like you're kind of artificially breaking the symmetry, comparing the bottom picture to the top picture. Um, is the reason, and that they have to treat this, is the reason that Sorry, which, uh, which of the eight pictures is the bottom picture and which is the top? So, in the bottom diagram of four. Here? No, the right hand side. Uh huh. Um, there's a symmetry. Uh huh. Um, and it seems like when you're setting your rule at the top, you would have artificially breaking that symmetry. Moving red. This, it would be the same probably as rotating in the bottom by 180 degrees to get back. So the red looks like, you know, so the, uh, the green one looks like it hasn't been moved. Ah, that's right. Thank you. Um, so I did something artificial. I think yeah, maybe this answer. The artificial thing that I did was that if I go back to sort of the original symplectic setup, of course, I L prime and L do not have a canonical homeomorphism. They are, they are homeomorphic in a way that's only canonical up to a danger <coughs> around this curve. Whereas I've set up my definitions over here to where I, I've drawn the new C prime on the original surface L. So that's like I fixed some homeomorphism between L prime and L. Um, and that arbitrary choice is going to sort of carry through and break some amount of symmetry. Um, is that? Yeah. Great. Yeah, thanks for the comment. So, so the good news is I can sort of produce new exact Lagrangians. Um, the bad news is the following. <laughs> so if C, suppose I had some curve, C J prime after the mutation, this is not embedded. So originally I allowed immersed curves in the picture, um, but then I said, okay, here's, a, here's an operation I can do with an embedded curve. <coughs> so if it's not embedded, then there's no surgery. Um, I can't perform this operation. And this new disk of the case prime. Okay. So there's a warning. Now, when does this happen? This is going to happen whenever CJ um, and CK have intersections of opposite signs. Okay? So 
let's go back and let's think about our uh, running example up here. Okay, so let's say I have C1 prime, C2 prime, C3 prime. What happens if I try to mutate at C2 prime now? So I look at the three intersections, the other curves along the green curve. According to my convention, these two are negative, and this one is positive. So I do something at that positive intersection. First I reverse that so the blue curve gets left alone. The red curve stays the same outside the neighborhood of that positive intersection. We're kind of away from that. And then at that intersection, I twist it around the green curve. But now when I twist it around the green curve, I create a self-intersection near this other negative intersection between the red and the green curve. because now I can't subsequently use it at the right curve again. I can't do a disk surgery there. Um, but fortunately here, the, the problem was not with the example. The problem was that we were stupid. Um, so this kind of problem was our fault. This was just a bad idea. Instead, I could move the whole picture by a Legendre and Sort of Clearly all the constructions that we've talked about so far are invariant under isotopies with Legendre and lists of these curves. So what I should do is I, if I, I should just take this red curve and move it up past the green curve. Um, they're going to become tangent at some point there, but because the co-orientations are opposite, they're lifting to opposite directions in T infinity of L. Okay? So when I pull them past each other, Everything is uh, kosher. And now, if I'd like, I can do a surgery at the disc that's ending on that red curve. Okay. Um, so that means if I want to perform. Here's what we need to do, but the problem is that sometimes you can't do that. Um, I can't always do this. In other words, I can draw some choices of C for which I can list some, some sequence of this, and there's just no way to perform an isotopy that allows me to perform that sequence of disc surgeries. Um, so let's say that... And it's always going to be what well, way to spoil my next uh, statement? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, let's say that C is non degenerate. Right?
certainly not every C is non-degenerate, but it's also really subtle to recognize when C is non-degenerate. So let's, let's do another um, example. So... Sorry? Yeah. The, in math, but, uh, uh -huh. um, it seems really naively like it might still lift to a Legendrian that's embedded, but then now it would be loose. So the Legendrian, of course, is embedded. Well, it's not a, I mean, this picture still names uh, a manifold with skeleton, yeah, yeah. but it's just one of the disks in there, its boundary has a self intersection. The boundary has a self-intersection, but of course this picture is nonsense. Yeah, I understand that. Um, I, was just, I was just asking about what that red Lissandrian was. That's right. So the, the, it's not, it seems that once you go through a crossing on the torus, mm -hmm. you don't get to keep the Lissandrian isotopic, but maybe that can be Is it still going to be the Lissandrian isotopic? Uh, that? Uh, I'll ask this question as a follow-up. Uh -huh. That, that could be drawn there. Suppose, uh, compare that to what happens when you mutate at the um, green curve now in that second yeah. diagram. Yeah. Is it the same and curve? The, the, the as two as and if you don't know, maybe we should say that. I don't believe they are. Yeah, that, that was my question. Okay, because okay, as soon as you have that self intersection there, um, I, I don't think you could remove in the current projection. I don't think you can remove it with that. Okay. Uh, yeah. So let me. the picture on a punctured course. So let's say that uh, now L T3 uh, minus uh, three points. Or sorry, T2 minus three points. So I'm going to compare the same kind of picture, but I'm going to put those punctures in different places. And because I'm, I'm getting lazy, I'm going to stop drawing hairs on all the curves. Uh, and I'm just going to draw <coughs> arrows. So the hairs should point to the right of the arrows. Okay, so in one picture I'm going to put my three punctures here, and in the other picture I'm going to put uh, my three punctures there. So these punctures look very similar, but I claim one of them is non-degenerate, and the other one is not. Okay. So even similar looking things can actually behave quite differently under this operation. Um, so hopefully it's not clear immediately which one is the good picture and which one is the bad picture. Um, so let's think about this top one. So I claim this one is bad, uh, and this one is good, it's non-degenerate. So let's start by thinking what happens if I take this to see that this is bad, Let's do a mutation of the blue curve. Right, so what happens now? So, so if pairs are rightward for these orientations, everything gets left alone except that green curve. Blue gets reversed. Orange stays the same. And green has to better out like this. Okay. I still have my punctures here and here. 
And now if I let's do a second one, second mutation now at the red curve. So again, the, old, the green curve is the only thing that's going to change. And the result of the picture, so now green has to bend again when it meets the red curve. where those punctures are, if I try to, so if I look at the green and the orange curve now, I have a, a positive intersection and a negative intersection. But there's no way to do the isot to do an isotopy that removes those, right? Because I can't, I would like to sort of pull this past here, I can't go that puncture. Likewise, I can't take this part and pull it out past here because of this puncture. So the precise choice that I had a hole there, as opposed to down here, means that now Means if I had done this sequence down here, I would be okay. But up there, sort of there was a problem. And it would be sort of just the same situation, rather than putting punctures here, I could attach a, a handle and add some genes to this curve. It would be the same issue. All right, so when you say the bottom one is good, are you asserting that it's really non-degenerate or you just don't have this particular? Um, I actually this one, I think, is provably non detected It's a finite type, but I don't know what's wrong. It's like, you check the non so you have to check that for all these four mutations, you say you're okay, and then you're okay forever when you change the mutation? No, no, I'm saying, it, uh, so I'm not claiming it. So I claim that, I mean, we just checked that the top one was not non-degenerate. It's not obvious at this point that the bottom one is, um, and that's, some special nice thing about this one that is fine and tight. Uh, okay, so in general, it's hard to figure out when things are non-degenerate. Um, but as was mentioned, so there's at least one good case. Uh, so if L is P2 and the CI are flat geodesics, <laughs> Which, yeah, yeah, here's a big uh, <laughs> Maybe the point is that the picture is not so relevant. <laughs> it was fine. Was it, was it okay? Okay. Um, it wasn't what I expected, but. <laughs> anyway, uh, so of course, if this is related to, I mean, what a lot of other people have stemmed, um, for example, this is the case relevant. relevant to the sort of application that I alluded to at the beginning, 
if you're studying my blood phase of local system on, on a surface, then it's actually very important to talk about higher genus surfaces and surfaces with them. So there are interesting cases that are not um, very definitely not covered by this statement. Um, so how much time do I have? Five minutes? Um, so okay, let me move on to my global sheets. Piecewise part contained in your union of the CI that goes around the puncture. But that's gonna that's kind of the point. Uh, if I had more than 20 minutes, I would start trying to say something about that. Uh -huh. um, but let me Lagrangian, but we built it by sort of patching together conical Lagrangians. So the result is I'm going to be able to glue together categories of microlocal sheets on those conical pieces into a global category of objects on the whole skeleton S. Um, so I have the advantage over David that uh, all of the, the sheets that I care about live on some two-dimensional object, so I can actually draw you pictures of them. And the simple, uh, I only need sort of very simple local examples. So let me sort of just review the basic setup from yesterday. So if I have a conical Lagrangian and the cotangent bundle of a manifold M, so this name's a category of constructible sheaves singular supported on um, so these are sheaves on S with some certain singular support on Alcon and this category localizes not just over M Micro-localizes over um, this conical one. So the example that's relevant today So we care about conical Lagrangians that are like a torus together with the union of the cones over those Lagrangians I pictured there. So locally, the most complicated picture we have to understand is just um, a neighborhood of one of the crossings up there. So by way of reviewing the notions up there, I'll just spell out exactly what they mean in that relevant local picture. in a 
neighborhood of well, before we draw them like that, if I draw the whole uh, union of R2 with the cones over these guys, then what I get is sort of R2 with two pins sticking out of it. Anything sort of micro local, talking about a sheaf on this base. The whole the, the sort of idea here is uh, so these spins are meant to, if we're talking about sheaves that are local systems away from each of these spins. So to draw a sheaf with this singular spin, I give you a local system on each of these quadrants. Now, the quadrants are contractible. So we give you a local system on them. This is just giving you vector, four vector spaces, basically, the stock at some point. So I give you a vector space here, one there, there. And then I give you maps between them. What allowing a sheep to have singular support on one of these spins is saying that I'm going to allow this map to be non-invertible. So if I said, look at four vector spaces with a bunch of invertible maps, that would be just saying, I'm giving you a local system R2, and now we're allowing things to have invertible <coughs> maps. So here's the kind of data of a constructible sheep in this category. Um, but I can explicitly uh, sort of name the thing in terms of algebraic data. So this picture is kind of redundant. Actually, if I just take this, and I only remember the maps um, on the bottom part of the picture, so A, B, C. So this is a representation of this P3 quiver. And actually, this is an equivalent of category. So, this sort of simplest local picture we have to understand, this looks like representations of this quiver. And when I talk about micro-local sheaves on this whole skeleton, we're just talking about gluing together categories that are of this form. So 
equivalence of the category of the micro sheaves associated with these skeletons. Um, of course, this is exactly what you're supposed to expect. So, um, if you believe, Morphism. Okay. So the idea is that this is capturing some version of the Fukai category of WC. So we've proven sort of by hand a theorem about sheaves that would be a corollary of that. Um, so what's the in this example, we said that the sort of simplest example of such a sheet was just a local system on the base there. So the simplest example of a micro local sheet on S The natural question to ask is: I have, I, if I have this equivalence over here, I want to compare. some comparison between those two tori. What is it? So let's say that uh, the answer is uh, so you a cluster transformation or cluster X transformation. What is that? I'm just going to tell you how to. I'm going to name this rational map here by telling you how a monomial on that right torus pulls back. So monomials on that are labeled by um, elements of each lower one in L. So let's say over Z n or Z Z gamma for the corresponding monomial and. or minus here that corresponds to some choice we made in defining uh, from, the, from 
setting up this uh, global category. So that's not so important. Um, first remark. So in the case of uh, when L is a torus, I'm just describing the effect of a single disc surgery. This is an old computation of Denis. Um, and I think uh, it's uh, all cytal observation that would re-describe the results of that simple example of a wall crossing transformation as an example of a cluster transformation. Um, and let me, all right, so when did I start? For five more minutes. Five more minutes, great. That's um, So I just want to say a few words about where this formula comes from, from the point of view of sheets. So let's go back to the, the beginning of the talk. have this picture of a single disk surgery. Because we're talking about local objects, sheaves, and because we define an operation that's just local to a neighborhood of the disk, I just need to understand this picture once and for all, and whatever I compute sort of locally is going to determine this formula here. So I want to compare um, I'm trying to compare these two about this picture associated to this sort of singular part of the movie right here. So I can think of this, um, so there's a separate common description of this guy. I can think of this cone as being R2. on this have a natural subcategory. So those are sheaves on the base, constructible with respect to this stratification by a point. So sitting inside here, I have the category of perverse sheaves on R2 with that stratification. So the, the claim is that both of these categories sit inside this sort of common abelian category. I don't have to tell you what this is, and sort of directly, because there's a classical description in terms of quivers. This is equal to representations of a quiver with two arrows, x, y, before and after the disc surgery are just ways of thinking of this category in sort of two asymmetric ways. So on one of them, so we have these pairs that have changed direction before and after the surgery. So I'm going to define a sheaf on both sides of those pictures given 
this data. So on one side, let's I define a sheet whose stock is A. The stock is B over here. I have monodromies M A and M B. And I'm going to define a sheet by letting X be the map across here. Category over here is just I do the same thing. I have A and B. But now I'm going to define a sheaf using Y to be the, the parallel transfer across the Now if I take this equation, so now I, I, I sort of I use these two identifications with this, this quiver category here. And now that's, uh, I can go and compute what I'm supposed to have over there. And if I rewrite this, I have y equals x inverse times 1 minus the monodromy. I go, I look at this picture, I say, suppose I knew x, suppose I knew the parallel transport over here. I compute the parallel transport over here by saying, okay, every time I cross this curve, I'm going to pick up a factor of the old parallel transport times this 1 minus the monitor. I pick up this term every time I cross that curve. So I'm going to pick up this term for a number of times that I cross CK. Okay. So this is the local computation that gets us this answer here. So I think, thanks for your time. condition for a second, where I just, I didn't impose any condition like, so here I sort of impose a condition, D is the cone over A goes to B plus C. If I looked at a sheet where that was not the case, it would have singular support on a conic Lagrangian bigger than the one I figured. Uh, what? Sorry. It's like very simple. Why do you never need to think about what to assign to the disk? That's somehow, you always have to assign something trivial. Ah, well, if I, I'm talking about a sheaf on R2, um, if it's constructible and that's the stratification, I look in the complement of that stratification, on um, each component I'm going to have a local system, but there those components are contractible. So a local system is... Are you asking the question about how do you name what happened on the sins, I think? Ah, oh, thank you. Um, it's, yeah, yeah. So the, I name what happens on the fins. So what's the sort of micro-local stock at a point here? This is just going to be a cone over this map. Um, yeah. Other questions? No, let's stand this